Congress. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time out to join us today. Um, I'm going to start off uh, by giving an update on uh, the food bank's response to the COVID-19 emergency. Uh, then I'll be turning it over to Kate Brewster, Executive Director of the Johnny Cake Center in Peacedale. Um, and then uh, toward the end, uh, we'll be glad to answer questions. And you can log in to the question and answer uh, box, which is uh, on the lower part of the screen. Type in uh, any questions that you have for us and we'll be glad to, to answer. Uh, so look, you don't have to be a clinical psychologist to see how the pandemic is increasing anxiety and stress for just about everybody. We're all worried about keeping ourselves healthy uh, and we're worried about keeping all the people around us safe from the virus. And now in addition to these health concerns, there are thousands of Rhode Islanders who are, are worried about having enough food to feed their families. Uh, the uh, COVID-19 emergency has wrecked the economy. 200,000 Rhode Islanders are unemployed today. And in record numbers, they are turning to food pantries and meal programs that are part of the food bank's statewide network of our community partners, what we call member agencies, for help. Um, in, in a little bit, uh, Kate can describe the increased numbers that they've seen at, uh, at the Johnny Cake Center. I can tell you that uh, we're hearing from agencies across the state and they're all telling us uh, the lines are longer than ever uh, due to so many new people needing food assistance. And oh, in response, the food bank is distributing significantly more food uh, to this network of food pantries and meal programs. Um, we actually have, a, I think, a slide that shows the, the increase in April. So this is a 40% a increase in uh, pounds distributed in April. And uh, we're doing that along with increasing all of the deliveries on our trucks to uh, food pantries in order to just be able to ensure that uh, no one is, is turned away. Um, now the food bank and our member agencies are just part of the state's response to this uh, dramatic increase in need. Uh, the state has mobilized to deliver meals to families that are quarantined, to provide uh, grab and go meals for uh, kids that are missing out on school lunch, to increase SNAP benefits and to increase benefits uh, for families that have school-aged children. Uh, Rhode Island Meals on Wheels has in significantly increased the delivery of meals to uh, homebound seniors. And FEMA has provided 150,000 meals to Rhode Island that the food bank is distributing to cities and towns to their emergency management agencies. Most of those meals are going to seniors too. Uh, and this response is really impressive uh, and important, but a lot of those measures, a lot of the effort is short term. It's, it's an emergency response. Uh, and, you know, for example, FEMA meals uh, will be ending over the coming weeks and FEMA will be ending its operations in the state. So we were really glad to uh, see and be part of a new program that the federal government has created called Farmers to Families. It's really intended to help farmers uh, that have been hurt in the COVID-19 emergency. And we've all seen the pictures of farmers plowing over their fields. Um, and this program is intended to pay farmers. So then instead of doing that, they take their crops and donate them to food banks. Uh, now it's important to know 
and to remember that you know the, the a large part of our food distribution at the food bank is fresh produce uh, typically apples carrots potatoes onions um, what this new program is going to do uh, the the uh, contract winner in the state is farm fresh rhode island and we're really happy to work with them what they're going to be doing is sourcing food from local farms um, and they're Farm Fresh is creating a box uh, that will create, you know, include a variety of um, vegetables and also um, milk from uh, Wright's Dairy Farm. Uh, and they're going to put that into a box. We are going to be able to distribute those boxes every week um, to people in need through our uh, food pantry network. Uh, so it's, you know, it's a a terrific addition uh, to what we're doing. And we particularly like the fact that uh, Farm Fresh is gonna be delivering this to us in a box. Boxes are important right now because in order to maintain social distancing, food pantries can't let people come in where we normally would, come in and um, select what they want off of shelves. We have to pre-bag, pre-box all the food. Um, and, you know, I just have to say that agencies uh, across the state, the ones we work with, have done an amazing job uh, changing their operations and how they serve people to keep, to keep everybody safe. Uh, but that, that seems like a, a, a perfect um, moment to introduce Kate Brewster. Uh, Kate Brewster, as I said, is the executive director of the Johnny Cake Center in Peacedale. She's also a board member at the Food Bank. Welcome, Kate. Thank you, Andrew. Greetings from Peacedale and the future home of the Johnny Cake Center, which is located at Fersey Road. Um, I thought that since we received a donation of 3,720 jars of peanut butter Wednesday, that it would be a great backdrop um, for this discussion. So um, just quickly, the Johnny Cake Center is a basic needs organization. We have a food pantry that serves the towns of South Kingstown, Narragansett, Jamestown, and Block Island. I first wanna thank you, Andrew, for the outstanding job that you and your team have done ramping up operations and deliveries. It has been amazing. I can tell you that those first few weeks when people were lining up and the phone was ringing off the hook, every time that food bank truck pulled in our narrow little driveway, it was a sigh of relief. And I really, I wanna thank Joe, the driver, um, who does an amazing job. And I know the drivers are working overtime and really hard right now delivering twice as much, three times as much food as they might normally to us. So thank you for that. Um, I'm happy to provide just a brief overview of how the Johnny Cake Center is dealing with the new normal here. Uh, like so many other communities, ours has been hit hard. Um, our economy, we have a hospitality economy in South County. So lots of restaurant workers, lots of housekeepers and commercial fishermen. And so many of them are newly out of work. Uh, like so many food pantries, we have seen a significant uptick in our um, people coming through, newly our existing members, um, as schools closed and people were losing their jobs. So let me just say a few, um, few benchmarks. We operate a school vacation meals program all, all summer and uh, during the school year when kids are out of school. And we provide groceries to kids um, through that program. And I guess our first major accomplishment was that uh, we were totally unprepared um, to launch that program uh, overnight, really over the weekend. Schools closed on a Friday. We said, how are we gonna do this on Monday? Um, but we were able to um, because of our community, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And to date, we have served 15,000 school breakfasts and lunches. And just to put that into context, we did 19,000 all of last year. And we're in week nine. And of course, we're gonna go right through um, as long as it takes until the kids are back in school. So that was, that's been um, terrific. We're also delivering to many, many, many more households. We had already been delivering to homebound seniors and people with disabilities. We're now delivering to folks who are compromised and have a health compromised issue and are afraid to leave or can't leave. Um, we're delivering to families without transportation. So we're probably doing between 30 and 40 deliveries a week um, to different families every single week. We have had over a hundred new people sign up for um, our pantry. And again, to, to 
make a comparison there, we had 300 new people sign up in all of 2019. So just in the last six to seven weeks, more than 100 new folks are coming to us. Lots of young people, um, which is um, young single adults, uh, clearly people who are out of work, maybe haven't received their unemployment benefits yet. And lastly, um, we are spending a lot more on food. We're probably spending between four and five times what we might normally. We get a tremendous amount of food from the food bank at no cost. But for programs like our school vacation meals, we want to make sure kids are getting certain items that we might not be able to get um, from the food bank. So milk, um, bread on a regular basis. Um, so there's, there's things that we do buy and um, we're buying a lot more. And of course, food prices seem to be up. I feel it, I'm sure, you know, and I think we all feel it and we're certainly experiencing that as well. A couple, I guess, bright spots. Um, I think that over the last couple weeks, we have seen um, things drop off a little bit or level out a little bit. And I really think that's because of the government assistance. And you have been a wonderful advocate uh, calling for increased SNAP benefits. That has made a difference. The unemployment benefits, the bump up um, has made a big difference and the stimulus checks. And sometimes we see families that come to us all the time and I've asked them, hey, I haven't seen you in a couple of weeks. And they'll say, well, we, we're, we're good. We got um, more SNAP, we got our unemployment and they're very conscientious and they don't come if they don't really need to. And so that's been a little bit um, of a relief. And I think it's important to note that government assistance really does make a huge difference um, in both the good times and the bad for folks at the bottom. Um, also, some of you might have seen on social media that the Johnny Cake Center has gone to Block Island twice now. We have a third trip planned. Um, the little food closet out there, Helping Hands, which operates out of a church, was pretty overwhelmed um, by the number of workers and families who are out there ready to work, construction workers, hospitality workers, dishwashers, um, and the season hasn't started. And there are very strict quarantine and uh, stay-at-home restrictions on the island. And so... Folks can't leave and go to the stop and shop in Narragansett. If they go back, they have to stay at home for 14 days. Food's not getting there as easily. So we've made two trips with two van loads of food, thanks to the food bank. Um, I think we've brought out at least 5,000 pounds each time and served more than 220 people every both times that we've been there. So that's been a unique um, thing. You know, we just didn't expect to find. And the people out there are so grateful Many are immigrants, many don't speak English, and um, I think they were really in a pickle. And so we've been very grateful um, to have the support of the food bank that has been packaging up a separate pallets of food for us. Um, and we're bagging it all up and having it ready to distribute. And I'll um, share with you a visual of that in a little bit. So just to wrap up, I know a lot of our donors and supporters of the Johnny Cake Center are on the call. I want them to know that every dollar, every box of cereal, Every snack for the kids has made an unbelievable difference. Um, we operate a thrift store, so as the Johnny Cake Center in Westerly does, both our stores are closed. That's an important source of income for us, so that is not um, being generated right now. We have food costs that are exploding, and it's really been the community that has had our back and completely um, been there for us 100%, so I just want to thank everybody for that. Kate, that is such a remarkable effort. Everything that you're doing for Block Island, everything that you're doing for everyone in South County, it, it's just incredible. And you know, I wanted to ask, you know, as you're thinking about the future, um, you know, we always say no one is ever just hungry. What are the, the problems and issues that you think the families are going to be facing in the months ahead? Well, certainly housing, everyone's scared to death if they're behind on their rent or their mortgage. Um, even if they're not this month, next month could be a different situation. That's um, the biggest fear that we're hearing is, how am I going to pay my rent? Um, you know, I think for us, um, what the kids are going to do this summer, I know the governor just um, issued some, you know, a word that summer camp might open, but you know, we know that these kids are going to need something to do this summer. Um, and we've got kids, lots of kids in public housing who really, we've been sending to camp, all of them every summer. And if they can't all go off uh, to camp, that will be a challenge. But clearly, I think none of us know what next week is going to bring, right? And, and so it's really just the unknown. But clearly, um, people's housing and um, getting back to work and the restaurants are really frustrated down here. Um, so those, are, those were the biggies that just come to mind. 
Yeah, and I, you know, I, I want to say again, as we're going back to, you know, uh, everything that you've done to uh, help so many more people, uh, you've also had to do uh, with an eye towards social distancing and keeping everybody, all your volunteers and staff safe and, and all the people who are coming for food assistance safe. And I'm sure that's made things much more complicated. Yes. Um, I mean, we had to get our volunteer base, which had already depleted significantly. I was one of the things I was going to mention later. Um, we've lost 95% of our volunteers because they're older. Um, many of them wanted to stay and they're spouses and their doctors said you are not going into that food pantry <laughs> um so even though they wanted to be there so we've implemented all kinds of new protocols nobody's coming into the pantry you know prior as you said people normally came in picked out their food we now have everybody outside we can do call aheads we prepackage. it's waiting on a table we try to do our best to offer our choices when it comes to what kind of meat do you want or what kind of vegetables do you want but in some ways we're just having to you know, put those packages together and put them out. But yeah, it's been a real challenge. My gosh. But why don't we show some uh, photos and pictures to folks that will illustrate what we're talking about. Um, I'll, I'll start by talking about um, the first few pictures. Uh, this first one is actually uh, the inside of the North Kingstown Food Pantry. Uh, two volunteers, they are both uh, school nurses who have chosen to volunteer at the food pantry while schools close. Here's an item we don't often get at food pantries, uh, seedlings uh, to help people grow their own food. Uh, this is at the East Bay Food Pantry in Bristol. Thanks to our friends at the URI Master Gardeners Program, uh, we're able to give out these uh, wonderful seedlings. Most of the volunteers in these pictures are wearing masks and gloves, as Kate said, the new normal. And this is food being distributed um, in Providence at the Onlyville Food Center, which is part of Federal Hill House. Um, their numbers uh, in Onlyville have doubled since March. Here's our truck driver from the food bank. Uh, delivering fresh pr produce. In this case, you know, Andrew just said, we only have apples, carrots, potatoes, and onions. And what do I show you a picture of pineapples? Uh, <laughs> how, do, how, do you, how do I explain this? Uh, so the, the food supply chain is chaotic uh, and it has led to some unusual donations uh, for us, uh, including these pineapples that um, our driver, John, is delivering to uh, I think that I think this may have been Project Outreach in Providence. Here we are at Project Outreach with uh, uh, more regular uh, fresh produce ready to be distributed to folks in Providence. You know, sometimes um, it's we're giving out a lot of food, a lot of bags and boxes to people. It helps to have a cart. Um, the amount of food that any one family receives is based on the family size. Here's a volunteer at Good Neighbors in East Providence uh, bagging fresh produce. Again, uh, at, at Good Neighbors, they've completely changed their operation to include uh, drive through So cars pull up and food is placed in the trunk of the car. Uh, folks have a car. Uh, to maintain social distancing. And the St. Vincent de Paul Food Pantry at St. Raymond's Church um, had to move their distribution actually outdoors um, in order to be able to accommodate social distancing, which uh, can mean some cold days, uh, even in May, for mm -hmm. volunteers. Uh, I think the next pictures uh, are the Johnny Cake Center, Kate. Yes, so um, this is just to give you an example of what a family with three children would receive in their school vacation meals, um, groceries every week. So we try to change up some of the items, but for the most part, we try to have staples, bread, milk, eggs, cheese, and the like. 
And this is a picture of the weekend in between the schools closing and that Monday morning. I'll tell a quick funny story. I went to the grocery store with my own husband that Friday night for our own family and started loading up my cart with bread. And my husband said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I, I need 300 loaves of bread by Monday. You know, and he looked at me and said, well, I'm not gonna get there tonight. Um, and so we issued a, a call to the community to donate and everybody turned out and we were, that is why we were able to do what we did that Monday morning. So this is folks dropping off outside our building. This is Joe, who I mentioned earlier, and this is the wall of school vacation mailboxes um, and toilet paper that he, that was just one part of the delivery. And I, it was the first time um, since I've been at the Johnny Cake Center, I felt like I really had to um, arm the alarm system before I left that night because all that toilet paper had been brought in and I figured somebody might have seen it. And uh, it's funny how little things like that uh, change. And this is uh, the Monday that the first Monday schools were closed. We had some volunteers. They helped us pack up um, groceries for every family. So like each row that you see here going left to right is for one family. And um, we delivered that day, that afternoon to 40 families um, or maybe 30 out in public housing in um, South Kingstown at Champaign Heights. We wanted to get ahead of uh, any crowds that might so happened when we first opened up on Tuesday. So we were able to deliver for 100 children in that public housing complex um, with the help of volunteers that Monday. And here's one of the families up there receiving a delivery with our member services director, Jen Kruger and Kelsey Trubia, who's a school social worker. And this is one of our fabulous remaining volunteers, Gina um, O'Connell, who, as I said, we lost so many volunteers, many who wanted to stay, but just couldn't. Um, so we have a handful who are left and they're doing more than one shift on many occasions. And we are super, super grateful to them. Uh, we get lots of questions, of course. What can we donate? What can we donate? And our message has just been consistent. Cereal and snacks. That's, those are two items that are really tough for us to get. They're expensive. And here's um, two guys. I forget their names, which is terrible, but they were wonderful. They were from an investment group. Um, and one of them lives in Narragansett. And they showed up with this unbelievable donation of cereal and snacks. The community has really turned out um, in that way. And lastly, uh, this is what it looks like when you bring your food pantry to Block Island. Um, this is about half of the tables of groceries, but um, we've been, this last trip, they had the produce there ready and waiting, but we've been bringing over non-perishables, milk, eggs, bread, um, so much stuff, and people really are so incredibly grateful. So that's a shot of us out on the island. Thank you, Kate. Now here's just some, uh, ways to keep in touch with us, uh, you know, following us on social media is always a good idea if you want to know uh, the most up-to-date news. Uh, you know, I think by this point, folks have entered some questions for us in the Q&A box. Uh, why don't we take some time to answer a few questions? All right, I'm gonna jump on. Hi everybody, I'm Lisa Roth Blackman. I'm the Chief Philanthropy Officer at the Food Bank. And I have a few questions. And if you have additional questions as we are going along, please feel free to type them in that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, so um, one question was, do we track distribution by demographics or what's the breakdown? I think people are looking for a sense of who's being served. Oh, you know, we, we don't, um tracked by uh, when people are getting uh, food assistance. What we've done is last year, uh, right around this time, uh, we worked with Brown to conduct a, a big survey of people served uh, throughout the state. And one of the really important things that we found is that uh, a third of the families we serve, a third of the households are families with children, a third of the households are households with senior adults, two of the most vulnerable populations in terms of uh, hunger and food insecurity. Uh, and so, you know, much of what we do is, uh, particularly in this emergency, is geared to making sure that families with kids and senior adults are being served and getting the food they need. 
Great. Um, can you talk a little bit about the role of local city and state government and how it how it changed and how they support the food bank and obviously the federal government has played a big role as well here. Yeah, the federal government um, it has uh, provided waivers to the state and the state um, has the responsibility for then implementing uh, additional benefits uh, bringing in uh, food. Uh, through FEMA uh, uh, for people in need in, in this emergency. Uh, a lot of the really hard work connecting with the particular families that are uh, dealing with, say, being quarantined, they can't leave the house, or uh, senior adults who are really isolated, has fallen on uh, city and town officials. Uh, and they've done just an amazing job of reaching out and making sure that if families need deliveries, uh, they're getting those meals. Kate, do you want to? You mentioned before that you're doing some of that work. Yeah, we um, have worked closely with the senior center um, in both towns and coordinated deliveries um, of groceries. Sometimes when the senior bus might be coming from Narragansett or South Kingstown in the area, they'll pick up groceries and take them out to families that they're going, or seniors who they're going to anyway. So I think there's been a plenty of coordination, at least in our towns, um, in making sure that everybody who needs help has it. Um, there's a question, Kate, maybe you want to field this one. Should we have any concerns about food deliveries from the pantry or vendors being infected? Well, you know, it seems like there's a different message every night about what, how long the virus might stay on groceries and cardboard boxes, and it's hard to keep up. Um, we're doing our best. We try to let our donations sit now for 24 hours before we put them on the shelves or we wipe them down. Um, and then when they're going out, they're in bags. And certainly we're all protected as much as we can in terms of wearing masks and gloves. Um, but I think that, you know, we encourage folks on the other end to, you know, if they're more comfortable, wipe down the items that we give, rinse it off, certainly if it's fresh produce and so forth. But I won't pretend to be a health safety inspector who can really answer that question. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, we had a couple of questions about um, companies or organizations that have contributed above and beyond um, and sort of how the community support has been. I know, Kate, you referred to this. Andrew, maybe you can speak to it a little bit and then Kate, jump in if you want to. But we've seen a tremendous response from the community, both from uh, businesses, uh, from foundations, and from individuals. Uh, most recently, we've had lots of people donating their stimulus uh, checks as $1,200. And one after another saying that um, they know there are others who need it more. Um, and it's, it's really been incredibly heartwarming to see people responding that way and being so concerned about their neighbors and just wanting to do something. People want to be able to make a contribution. We've certainly had the same experience, both with our uh, normal philanthropic partners, the Rhode Island Foundation, United Way, um, Bank of America. So many have just, the money just showed up um, and they sent a check and said, you know, we, we want to help. And then certainly the individuals and businesses that have stepped up locally has been un real. Um, you know, I think some of us worry that six months down the road when, you know, if this problem and crisis continues, will there be donor fatigue? Um, I, you know, I don't suspect it will drop off too much, but I think that while things are, um, the money and the food is flowing in now, you know, what is the, what does it look like in six months? So we're being very mindful of that as we prepare um, down, for down the road. Yeah, and I think our, our message is the same. All of us are saying that uh, we do not see this as uh, a short-term problem, that the economic fallout is going to play out over months. And uh, the peop a lot of the people who are needing food assistance in this emergency right now are going to continue to need help going forward. Um, and there's a question just picking up on that of um, what is the greatest need and where do financial donations usually go? What are they supporting? Yeah, the need right now is, is all for food. Um, uh, you know, the food donations that we would normally get from 
uh, supermarkets are down and, and it has nothing to do with the generosity of supermarkets. They're very generous. They're big supporters of ours. But you've been to the supermarket. You've seen they're having trouble keeping their shelves stocked. So they don't have surplus to donate. Um, and that means that we have then two other sources uh, of food coming into the food bank. One is, uh, and we're grateful for the uh, food that we get from the USDA, from the government. And then there's food that we're able to bring in uh, because of the generosity of the public. We can purchase food from wholesalers. We do it in big volume, truckloads of food. And every day, truckloads of food are pulling up to the food bank thanks to the public support that we've been getting. Great. Um, here's a comment from uh, our friend Linda Katz. Great op-ed today, Andrew, and thanks for your great work, Kate. What do you think the likelihood is that Congress will increase SNAP and any suggestions for what state government can do in terms of a budget line item? Yeah, I mean, just in terms of the um, uh, SNAP, uh, we know, uh, and we've seen it in this emergency, that increasing SNAP benefits is the fastest way to get help uh, to families, particularly families with children. Um, in the past, what we've seen, uh, and, and we saw this in the survey that we did, so many families will run out of their benefits, SNAP benefits, before the end of the month and then have to turn to food pantries. That's because historically SNAP benefits have not kept up with the actual cost of food. In this emergency, SNAP benefits were increased. Um, the Department of Human Services really did a great job of getting those benefits to people. Additional benefits have been provided to families with kids. This means that people are able to shop for the food they need. Um, and it takes a tremendous amount of burden off of our emergency food system. Um, but we know um, that even if Congress fulfills what we're asking, which is a modest increase of 15% in SNAP benefits, even if Congress does that, and I, I do think that at this point there is bipartisan support for that. People see the need. It's just so clear. I, I hope it will go through. But even with that, we know that uh, the food assistance that we provide uh, through the food bank and all of our partners in the community is gonna to have to continue and it's gonna to have to continue at a, a much higher rate of distribution than in the past. So in past state budgets, the food bank has been allocated $175,000. Um, out of an $8 million budget, uh, you do the math. Um, and uh, we were very happy to see the governor increase, actually double that amount in her proposed budget for this fiscal year. And I know that the state is facing uh, lots of uh, problems in terms of worrying about uh, tax revenue and having enough to be able to fund all the services. But it's essential that uh, funding for the food bank be increased. It's essential that we maintain the state workers who work at Department of Human Services as part of the SNAP program. So if people need those benefits, they can enroll and access those benefits. Um, and you know, I think that uh, other crucial services are just Rhode Island Meals on Wheels, all these other programs, it's clear to everybody how important they are right now. If I could just chime in, Lisa, as a board member of the food bank, I would just encourage anybody on the call um, to call their state senator or representative if they want to make one uh, advocacy pitch to increase the food bank's um, funding from the state. It's high time after all these years that when it was cut that it been restored. And if not now, I don't know when would be a more appropriate time. Thank you. Um, Kate, this one's for you. Who packages your school vacation meals and how do you distribute the boxes? Tell us more details of how it works. It's a great effort. Um, our volunteers and staff, all of our staff pretty much pivoted to the food pantry. Um, and when folks come in and they say they're there for that, we package it up and um, the boxes are packaged at the food bank and delivered. Um, and that's uh, supported by Stop and Shop, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong, Andrew. So, um, you know, we've, it's our usual protocol. We, we 
the stuff together in our pantry, we bring it out, we um, leave it on a table and people can come and pick them up. Um, it's different than providing a hot meal. And uh, for some families, I think, you know, it's, it's things that they can leave in their fridge. If there's one thing we're hearing, it's the kids are eating the families out of house and home while they're home with this distance learning. I know it from my own experience. Um, so we try to provide things that can kind of be there all week. We also have a grab and go here in South Kingstown at the school um, with the school department twice a day. So it, between the two things, I think we're doing a pretty good job um, of making sure that children are being fed. And your hope to keep it up all summer? Oh, yeah. It's the new, it's the new normal. We used to sweat about the nine weeks over the summer and then we'd all be like, oh, the, you know, that was so much work and now it's just our regular um, business. So yes, we'll keep going as long as we have to. Great. Um, why are food prices increasing if there's so much excess from farms? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it depends on uh, the type of food. Um, as you've seen in the news, there are uh, food processing plants where the workers have gotten COVID-19 and they've had to shut down, which has uh, uh, quickly led to higher meat prices. Uh, you know, we uh, don't have a, a system that's easy to uh, change in this country in terms of the supply chain. It's not easy for farmers that had contracts with uh, restaurant distributors to suddenly sell to supermarkets. It, it's difficult for that to happen overnight. Um, and so uh, the demand right now is all at supermarkets since nobody is eating out. And that's gonna, that's gonna continue to drive up prices. And you know, for us, it's a great concern because it means that uh, just as we're advocating for increased SNAP benefits, uh, people's own cash and their SNAP benefits are going to not go as far as as uh, food prices go up. It is a big concern, and and I know something that affects all families. Great. Um, when do you see a time when our guests will be able will be able to do more choosing in their selection of food, moving to a more farmers market setting and away from just handing out the prepacked bags? It's a well, great. Certainly, in, uh, I'll 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 say that in the pantry, it'll it'll depend largely on the number of folks that are allowed to gather. Um, so for us, our facility, current facility where we provide food, is extremely small. So um, between volunteers, staff, you know, you could never let anybody in right now. Um, that's why we bought this new big building. We put, plan to go to more of a market style pantry where people walk around and are able to select off the shelves. But I think, you know, it's, there's so many unknowns. Um, we're just taking it week by week. You know, we're, we are thinking that it is possible that, um, the, you know, wearing the masks and uh, social distancing uh, may go on for a very long time and may become something that we uh, have to adjust to until there, until there's a vaccine, uh, which could be a long time. Okay. Um, here I have a question on behalf of Bishop Nisley and Archdeacon Jan Grinnell from the Episcopal Diocese. Two questions. Is there anything needed from our congregations while we are still in the reopening phases? And what do you see the needs to be after we get through reopening? Yeah. I'll just say I want to first thank the um, Episcopal Charities. They have been very generous in providing funds in this crisis. Um, I think, you know, right now the message from the Johnny Cake Center, I'm not exactly sure about other pantries, is we just need funds to buy the food or the food. Um, so to the extent that those donations can keep coming, that's wonderful. And again, it's really hard to see down the road um, what, what, the new, what the next reality will be. But Andrew, I'll let you jump in. No, I absolutely agree with what you're saying. I think that um, food and funds are the most important thing right now. Uh, keeping everybody in the community up to date with what the response is uh, uh, so that folks understand how this is, is going to change over time. Right now we're in the emergency response mode, uh, but that will uh, 
that will slowly change and we'll be left with a, a very, very, very high level of need. So we're going to reach out to um, leaders in the faith community to help us as they always have. Um, here's a question about uh, how farmers markets can play more of a role in helping those in need. I know SNAP is allowed, but only for certain items. Yeah, I, uh, so there um, are farmers markets that are able to uh, take SNAP benefits um, and uh, folks are able to uh, basically double the value of SNAP benefits at the farmers markets. Uh, I think we're all waiting to see how farmers markets change uh, to allow social distancing. I, I feel like it's, uh, it's just a, a matter of logistics to make that happen. Uh, so we really hope that the farmers markets are back up in operation this summer and uh, uh, healthy locally grown food will be available to everybody, including folks who are using SNAP benefits. Um, and the question about whether we can purchase excess food from the restaurant wholesale suppliers. Uh, uh, we mainly have been seeing donations of that food um, in the in the most recent times, uh, and then you know over the longer term, I think that that uh, farmers to families program that I described is really intended to. Uh, turn that whole restaurant uh, food supply chain to uh, food banks. Um, and uh, the government will be helping by paying farmers and paying distributors uh, so we can uh, get that food. The, obviously the folks who are left out of the equation, sadly are restaurants who are uh, you know, really struggling. Um, Obviously, a lot of the people who are helping now are people who are uh, laid off from that industry. And um, it's hard to know, uh, given all the limitations around COVID-19, how that industry and how restaurants are going to come back. Uh, but uh, we all have to support them when they do. Great, and the last question I have, uh, oh, another one just popped up, is are there opportunities to volunteer in person at either the food bank or at member agencies? I'll take that first, Andrew. We, um, we've had so many people reach out wanting to volunteer. Our message is, um, you know, to sit tight. We're making a list of names. Um, for the most part, we're trying to keep it to our staff and the volunteers who had been there prior. We just don't have the space to accommodate um, that many people. And so um, we're keeping it simple right now, but we certainly know that our own volunteers will uh, need a break at some point. And so we are keeping track of those folks who are interested. Same thing. I, I agree with what Kate said. Sit tight. Um, we have uh, reduced the number of people who are working at the food bank to about half our staff uh, in keeping in line with Department of Health suggestions and, and their guidelines. Um, as the governor begins to allow uh, larger groups to gather and uh, that can happen without, uh, you know, uh, increasing the risk of the virus, we will gradually have more staff in the building and then down the line, probably um, not until the fall, have volunteers in the building. Now, I really appreciate how much folks want to help um, and, and each uh, member agency has different needs uh, and I think that if you are already uh, connected with uh, a food pantry or meal program uh, in your neighborhood, uh, give them a call and let them know that you want to be on their list too uh, to volunteer when uh, they can start having more people on site. And certainly, just Lisa, quickly, people can volunteer in very meaningful ways off site. Um, we've seen neighborhoods have food drives. Um, I mean, there's just been so many ways that communities and, of people um, have come together to have the same impact, um, just not being in our building. So that's, we're happy to provide some of those ideas. And I know the food bank has those um, on your website about what you can do 
um, and your, you know, with your family and friends to make a difference. Yeah, and we can post some of that and we'll share it out again afterwards. Um, there's a question about how will pantries decide which families and individuals get the farm to food boxes? I don't know, maybe Kate, do you want to field that one or Andrew, do you want to talk about quantity? Go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think that uh, uh, boxes are going to be uh, distributed quickly because they're obviously perishable and are going to have uh, milk and things that will have to go out quickly. Uh, so some of it is just making sure that it's going to uh, be uh, delivered to and that we'll be working with food pantries that have that uh, cold storage capacity and then have the capacity to um, get it right out to, uh, to people who need it. So, but, you know, there are some uh, food pantries that may only be open uh, once a week or once every other week. Those uh, are unlikely to be carrying the new farmers to families boxes. It's much more likely that it will be at uh, our uh, community partners that are open uh, most of the week every day. Um, we have a, a shout out and a question from our friends at Progresso Latino thanking us for um, the support of their pantry and wondering if we can comment on um, the fact that COVID-19 nationally has had such a devastating effect on Latino workers, looking at the unemployment rate tripling, and also the impact on, in terms of health and, and people being infected and um, any comment that we might have on that. Kate, do you want to start and then I'll... Um, certainly, we. I, I want to shout back out to Progresso Latino. Um, and say that um, now I'm, gonna, I'm forgetting the question. I was waiting for you, Andrew, to uh, to answer it. So I'm sorry. I mean, the piece about the health disparities. We certainly in South Kingstown, one of the populations that we serve um, are Native American families. So one in five of our visitors almost is um, report is, reports that they're Native American. So we certainly have been concerned. We know they have significant health disparities already. Um, and so we've certainly been keeping an eye on that and concerned about that. And um, Andrew, I, I'm sorry, I missed the, I can't remember what the first part No, you got it. You got it. I just think that the, the, this emergency, <clears throat> excuse me, has exposed inequality and injustice in the country that we knew was always there, but now it's so much more apparent. And uh, we have to make sure that people who are, uh, the most impacted by the, this health emergency are getting all the help they need. First and foremost, the health care that they need, but then for their families, making sure that all the assistance that they can get is available to them. And Progresso Latino is a core agency in the state in making sure that those families are served particularly the undocumented who are not going to be eligible for SNAP benefits. And I think that's something we don't worry too much about in South County. It's not as significant of a population, but certainly in the core city, um, that's something that folks should be very concerned about, that they're not getting the extra help that other people are. Great. Um, are there pockets or neighborhoods throughout Rhode Island who you are not able to reach? Um, and then a companion question, does the food bank have enough supply to meet the increased demand? I'll throw that to you, Andrew. Right now, we have the supply to keep up with the demand. Uh, and we're just worried about uh, the future. Um, but yes, right now, uh, we feel like we can work really closely with uh, food pantries across the state we find out about the uh, spikes in demand because they're calling us and they're saying, we need more food. Uh, we gave out all of our food. We need more and we are, you know, we'll send extra food, make extra deliveries as that happens. Um, we've learned a lot in this emergency about uh, the agencies that can really, really gear up uh, and serve more people uh, almost overnight. Uh, and we want to make sure that um, we keep them fully stocked. So, you know, we're there. The thing that keeps us up at night is will we be 
able to continue to do that in two or three months. And we're only going to be able to do that if we can continue to get the great support from the public that we've been getting so far. Certainly, if you can get to Block Island with all that food, we can pretty much get anywhere. I think that's a great example of, you know, just not, not understanding the need and uh, having a new need pop up um, based on this unique crisis. It is, absolutely. Great. Well, I don't see any more live questions, so I'll give it 30 seconds. Um, oh, another question popped up. Hang on a second. Um, so mixed status families are fearful of applying for SNAP, even though it is safe. Do you think food pantries can be helpful in getting out the message that it's safe to apply for SNAP benefits? Yeah, it's very important that um, we get out the uh, information to people who uh, are really afraid in this environment that uh, getting help is going to somehow affect their uh, immigration status. Uh, We've seen that also with the program that's called Pandemic EBT. This is uh, a, uh, a like a debit card that's been sent to families that have uh, kids that normally get free or reduced price lunch. Um, no one has to worry about using that EBT card and getting the food they need. It will not affect their uh, immigration status in any way. Uh, we're going to do our best uh, through our food pantries to get that word out. I, I, I just want to say it is harder um, in this environment uh, because it's hard to talk to people um, with everybody with masks on and everything um, and handing out bags and boxes. It makes it much harder. Uh, we try as much as possible to stuff information into those bags and boxes uh, particularly the excellent information that's been prepared for us by the Department of Human Services. So folks have up-to-date, accurate information about their eligibility for benefits, about uh, the, the way that uh, benefits and certain programs will not affect uh, immigration status or their concerns about uh, immigration and citizenship. Uh, we've gotten terrific materials from the Department of Human Services and also shout out to Linda Katz from EPI. So keep that information coming to us and we'll keep getting it out to the people who really need it. Great, thank you. Um, I don't see any additional open questions. So I think we'll give it a second and then say thank you all for coming and listening and being so uh, interested and, and caring about uh, this issue and all the people that we're trying to help. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Kate. And thank you, Andrew and Lisa, for doing an unbelievable job during all this.